to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. In our effort to teach people what God says about baptism, have we done a good job of telling people, now that you're baptized, here's what you need to do. I'm afraid maybe we've fallen down a little bit in that area, and today we want to ask the question, after baptism, now what? We're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. We want to encourage you, if you don't have your Bible handy, locate your Bible, get it ready, as we want to let the Word of God be our guide in every subject we study. Friend, we're so glad that you've joined us today. We want you to know that our lessons are being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Lord's Church. The Lord's Church in your area, the Church of Christ, would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. You'll find friendly people there who love God, who love others, who want the Word of God to come first, and who'd be happy to sit down, open up the Bible, and just simply search the scriptures with you. If you've got a Bible question, you'd like to know more about the church or worship or salvation, whatever it may be, you'll find people in the Lord's church who'd be happy to discuss the scriptures with you. Friend, we'd also like to help you here at the Gospel of Christ. Our mission and our aim is just simply to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We're not worried about your pocketbook. We're not worried about your money. We just simply want men and women to go to heaven. And with that aim in mind, friend, we want to encourage you to check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our material free of charge. We have over 500 lessons available, every book of the Old Testament, every book of the New Testament, a litany of topics that you can study from, written material, transcripts, questions, great tools for studying the Word of God. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of our series on the subject of baptism, this eight-lesson series on baptism, or any other subject, go to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, fill out a free media request form. We can send that to you instantaneously as a digital download or if you need a DVD or a CD, we'd be glad to provide that to you free of charge as well. Check us out on Facebook as well as the App Store. You can download the Gospel of Christ app, which is a great way to keep up with what we're doing, all our new lessons, study the Word of God, and our fast-paced world today. Let's now think about that question. After baptism, now what? Friend, it is right to stress the essentiality of baptism because the scriptures so clearly do. I mean, think about some of these verses we've talked about over the last few weeks. Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. John 3, verse 5. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, 16. We are buried with Christ in baptism into his death. Romans 6, 3 and 4. And baptism does now save us. No doubt about the fact. We have got to teach, the Bible teaches, the importance and the essentiality of baptism. But I wonder, in our effort to stress the essentiality of baptism and the plan of salvation, have we done as much to prepare ourselves to tell people what's necessary after baptism? A, a new Christian, a babe in Christ, shouldn't be left to fend for themselves. We need to continue to teach them all things. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, and not expect them just to kind of get it on their own as a child of God. We need to help and encourage in every way that we can. And so today, I want us to think about when someone obeys the gospel after they're baptized, what should we encourage them to do now that they are a Christian. First and foremost, if you have become a Christian, if you have obeyed the gospel, if you've been baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ, 
please realize the high calling of being a Christian. Acts 11 verse 26, they were called Christians first in Antioch. What a great privilege it is to be a child of God. If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God. In this name, 1 Peter 4, verse 16. You see, God has called Christians. It's such a high calling because God has called Christians to His glory. Isaiah 62, verses 1 and 2. God said when the Gentiles see His light, He will call His people by a new name. The Gentiles saw that light. Acts 11, verse 26, for the very first time, after Cornelius and his household had obeyed the gospel and other Gentiles, they were called Christians first, for the first time in Antioch. God has called us to glory in that name and in the life that we live. You see, I am the salt, I'm to be the, the salt of the earth. I'm to be the light of the world. Matthew 5, 14 and 16. Everything I do ought to be to God's glory. We are to proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's a, that's a high calling. I've been called out of darkness into his light, and I need to sing his praises, as it were. The Bible teaches that everything we do ought to be to God's glory. Whether we eat or whether we drink, whatever we do, we do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. Isaiah 43, verse 7, God said, Everyone who is called by my name, Christian, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have named him. We call ourselves children of God, Christians, followers of God. Friend, realize the high calling of that. We've been called to glorify God. Let's realize with that high calling, it's a high calling because Christians are partakers of a heavenly calling. I want you to open your Bible to Hebrews chapter 3 and listen to the beautiful language that the Hebrew writer mentions as it relates to that heavenly calling. Hebrews chapter 3, the Bible says this in verse number 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of your confession, Jesus Christ. It's a, it's a heavenly calling because we are called upward. Listen to Colossians 3.1. If then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of the Father. Do not set your mind on things below. Set your mind on things above. Friend, as a child of God, now that you're a Christian, realize what a privilege that high calling is. Use your life to glorify God. Be a partaker of that heavenly calling. And let's realize we've been called to a high calling because our life is now a life of glory and a life of virtue. 2 Peter 1 verse 3, God's given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and virtue. I am to produce the through the Spirit, love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. I am to add to my faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, all those things. You see, without holiness, no one can see God. I'm to put off the old man. I'm to put on the new man every day. Colossians 3, verse 5, Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 14. And so now that you're a Christian, after you've been baptized, realize the high calling of being a child of God. And then, my friend, Determine, make a determination, no matter what, to live faithful to Jesus every day. It's so sad that some people who obey the gospel only endure for a short time. Jesus spoke about that. The cares and troubles of this world come, and because they have no root, they only endure for a short time. Luke chapter 8, verse 13. You see, the Bible teaches that to be saved, We've got to endure to the end. Jesus said to suffering Christians in the book of Revelation, be faithful until death and I'll give you the crown of life. He who endures to the end shall be saved. Matthew 24, 13. No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. 
We've got to focus on what's in. If then you the Bible says in Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2, see then that we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily entrap us or ensnare us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Keep the faith no matter what. Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 through 8, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Henceforth or in the future, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, but not, not to me only, to all those who've loved his appearing. Now that you're a Christian, realize that high calling. Secondly, determine no matter what. No matter how bad it gets, no matter how good it is, no matter what trials and tribulations or difficulties we face, I'm going to be faithful to God the rest of my life, no matter what. Number three, after baptism, what do I do? Friend, you've got to do your best to shun evil companions. The Bible says, happy is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but happy is the man whose law, whose delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law, he does meditate day and night. One of the things that we want to emphasize is be very careful with the kind of people you run around with. They're going to have a big influence on you. You may have to do away with some friendships that are not good and are not going to help you go the right direction. You see, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, evil companions corrupt good morals. We freed ourselves. If you've obeyed the gospel, Jesus has freed you from the sin and the ungodliness and the entanglement of it. Why would you want to go back to running around with people who can make a negative influence on you. I understand we want to be a good example to them. We want to help them. We want to make a good impact on them. But I'm not going to drag myself in the process of drag myself down in the process of doing it. Proverbs chapter 12, verse number 26. Listen to these words. The righteous should choose his friends carefully. Why? For the way of the wicked leads them astray. Be very careful who you run around with. Be very careful of, of worldly-minded friends who are going to encourage you to focus on things of the world, not on things of God. Instead, make your strongest friends and your strongest connections with God's family. We now have a family of God. Ephesians 2 verse 19. We have brothers and sisters in Christ. Mark chapter 3 verse 35. And the Bible clearly tells us, do not associate, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Make friends of God's children. Help those who are weak. That's what we want to do as children of God. And friend, you can see it. It's so clear to see as you study the Bible. Throughout history, one of the downfalls of God's people in the Old Testament was they were too quick to befriend the nations around them. They were too quick to want to be like everybody else and they, they let that ungodly evil association affect them and drag them down. Now that you're a Christian, avoid evil, avoid evil companions and those who are going to drag you down. And then this idea. Now that you're a Christian, you've also got to avoid questionable places. I am not to be. We are clearly taught not to be friends of the world or the worldly. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. God says, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17 and 18. Do you not know adulterers and adulteresses, God says. Do you not know friendship with the world is enmity with God? What do you mean? Whoever therefore desires to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Do not love the world or the things of the world. All that's in the world, lust flesh, lust the eyes, the pride of life, it's not of the Father, it's of the wicked one in the world and all that's in it is one day passing away. But he who does the will of God will endure or abide forever. Avoid people and places that are not going to help you to be a good Christian. 
uh, if there are temptations that a person has, whatever that temptation of the flesh may be, don't put yourself in a compromising position. You know, you've got to draw a line somewhere. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 says, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good, and then verse 22, abstain from every appearance of evil. As the old song says, you've got to stand for something or you'll fall for everything. Take a stand. Draw a line in the sand. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to do what he says. These are things that I, I, I've got to avoid in my life so that I can see that temptation coming and not get caught up in it. You know, a lot of places people go today that are just not good and not right and not holy. Don't put yourself in a compromising place or a compromising situation. Friend, we would also say today, one of the greatest things that you can do now that you are a child of God, now that you're a Christian, is make it your aim to attend all the services of the saints. The Bible teaches us not to forsake the assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but to exhort one another and so much more as we see the day approaching. Christians are encouraged to not have forsake, to be there, to encourage, to uplift, to, to help one another. And that means we want to be there to remember the Lord's death and observe the Lord's Supper. Christians came together on the first day of every week of the week to partake of the Lord's Supper. They came together the first day of every week. Acts 20, verse 7, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2. As Christians, I want you to think about the, the benefit we get from attending services regularly. I am made to think about other people who I have an impact on, who have an impact on me, others who are struggling and less fortunate, those who encourage me every time I see them. When I've taken the Lord's Supper every Sunday, I'm made to think about what he did for me and how much that means. As I sing, I encourage others. They encourage me. My spirit is uplifted as we think about heaven, as we hear the preaching of God's word. That word is a mirror of the soul. It helps us to see who we really are. James 1 verses 20 through 25 and make changes where necessary. As we pray, we approach the throne of God where we can find grace and mercy to help in time of need. You want to do something that will really help you now that you're a Christian? Make, a, an, uh, make it your aim. Make a decision right now if you haven't already. I'm going to be there every time the doors are open. It will only help me. It will only benefit me spiritually. I will be able to help others. I will grow. I will learn. And I will be encouraged every opportunity that I have. Then, my friend, we would say this. Now that you've become a Christian, have an earnest desire to go home. Our home is not here. Philippians 3, 20 and 21 says, Our citizenship is in heaven, for which we eagerly wait for the Lord Jesus, who will transform our lowly body into his glorious body. We may be citizens in different parts of the country, even different parts of the world. But if you're a Christian, now that you are a Christian, your true citizenship is in heaven. This should be our earnest expectation. Paul said in Romans 8, 18, I consider the sufferings of this present time, they're not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 17 and 18, we, want, we long to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Philippians 1, verses 19 through 21. We've got to have that desire to let mortality let life be swallowed up with mortality. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 through chapter 5, verse number 3. Uh, Paul says, In this earthly tent we groan, longing to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven, when mortality is swallowed up, when life is mortality is swallowed up uh, in this life, my life. One day we have the hope of living with God, being with Him for all eternity, having the joy of knowing that no more death, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more crying is ever going to exist again. I want you to think about it this way. Think about what going home means to a weary traveler who's been on the road a long time. 
Have you ever been away from home for a real long time and you got homesick? Maybe you went to camp as a kid. Boy, you just couldn't wait to get home and hug your folks, sleep in your own bed, be around things you were comfortable with. Maybe you've been away for a longer time than that. Maybe not even because of your own choosing and, and finally you went back home. Can you remember that feeling? The joy, the comfort, and the happiness of crossing that threshold back home. Friend, that's what I want you to seize upon and I want you to think about. And that's got to be our motivation to go to heaven. Have an earnest desire more than anything else to go home. And so friend, we ask you today, are you ready to go home? Are you ready to be with God? As we think about these ideas and as we think about the importance of living for Jesus every day, let's make, let's make a commitment to do those things that will help us with that. Friend, where are we at in studying our Bible regularly? Here are some practical steps you can take that will just so readily set you up for success as a new Christian. Are you studying your Bible regularly? I'm talking about every day. The Bereans were more fair-minded because they searched the scriptures daily. Are you studying your Bible regularly every day? Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Matthew chapter five, Matthew chapter four, verses four through six. And uh, Paul told Timothy, study to show yourself approved unto God. And so make sure every day that you're studying your Bible. That's a great step for someone who's just obeyed the gospel. Secondly, make prayer a practical part of your everyday life. How's your prayer life? Luke chapter 18, verse one, Jesus said, men ought always to pray and never lose heart. Do we realize the importance of prayer? The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man overcomes much. Prayer takes us to the very throne. We come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find grace and mercy to help in time of need. Are you studying your Bible regularly? Have you made prayer a practical part of your everyday life? Thirdly, are you looking for ways to do something besides just fill your needs? And by that we mean this, what am I doing to help others? What's great about Christianity is we don't just look to make sure we're right, we want to help others as well. Jesus said it this way, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Acts 20 verse 35, what am I doing to encourage somebody who may be downtrodden? What am I doing to help somebody who may be sick, to benefit somebody who may not, to teach somebody who may not know the gospel, to do what I can to share with them the love and the mercy and the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so friend, as we think about these things, we ask you to look into your own life and make sure that you've made these commitments to Almighty God, that you're really willing to live like He wants us to. You see, the Bible teaches this. When I become a Christian, it's no longer about me and you. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, listen now, and you are not your own. What do you mean I'm not my own? You were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit with your hands. Let's realize when we submitted our lives to God in obeying the gospel, my life no longer came, became about, was no longer about me. My life now belongs to God. He paid the price. He paid the debt that I could not pay. And now my body and my spirit need to be used to glorify Him in every way. Maybe though, friend, you're not a Christian. Maybe you've never really obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Maybe you in these series of lessons have heard us talk about who is a candidate to be baptized, what baptism really is, what the purposes of it are, why it still stands, although objections have been offered. And maybe you've heard about this good life that we've talked about today, the high calling of being a Christian. And maybe you want that. Well, friend, we want that for you too. God wants you to be saved. 
God wants it more than anyone else. For the Bible says in 1 Timothy 2, verse number 4, God wants all men. That includes you. God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. The Lord is not slow concerning his promises. As some men count slowness. He's long-suffering toward us. Listen to this. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants you to be saved. He doesn't want anybody to be lost. And friend, we want that today for you as well. Maybe you would like to study more on what you need to do to be a Christian. The Lord's Church in your area, the local congregation there would be happy to sit down and study the scriptures with you. We encourage you to visit the local congregation there or we'd be happy to study with you as well. Visit us on our website. We've got a great deal of information there that would be a benefit to you also. But friend, maybe you just need that, that encouragement. And here is that encouragement. I don't know how long I've got. I don't know how long you've got, but I knew though, do know this. Whatever time I've got left, if I'll put my life in the hand of God, that life will be the best you can ever imagine because I have shunned and I have got rid of the sin and the problems of this world and I now have my eyes focused on the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you've never obeyed the gospel, do that. Life is short. Eternity is forever. God wants you to be saved. Don't spurn. Don't put off the invitation to get right with God. And if you are a Christian, and maybe some of these things haven't been in your life, friend, it's never too late to make that a part of it. God wants you to come back home. He wants you to make your life right with Him. He wants you to live a life that one day can be lived in such a way that one day you can hear these words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of your Lord. We're so glad that you've joined us for a day today for our study on the subject of baptism. If you'd like to have a copy of this series, please let us know. And we pray that you'll join us next time as we're going to study more from the Word of our God. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.